President Trump continues to downplay what's happened this week with Michael Cohen and the Russia probe, but this has been an extremely pivotal few days. A former federal prosecutor will join us with expert analysis. Then, an ethics attorney during George W. Bush's administration, he is speaking out about the Mueller probe, and he says, if the president was smart, he should work out a deal to step down now and cut a plea here that will, in effect, secure both he and his family. Then, an emotional day in D.C. as several senators give their farewell speeches, and one of the Republicans even took some shots at the White House on the way out. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Once again, we are at federal courthouses following the latest developments on multiple fronts. Let's start with Maria Butina. In D.C. today, the Russian national, she pled guilty to conspiracy to act as a foreign agent. That is part of a deal. She now is cooperating with prosecutors. Bettina, she admitted that she was establishing lines of communication with groups like the NRA with the intention of influencing U.S. politics in an election year. Now, prosecutors and congressional Democrats, they are following the money trail to see whether Russians were spending cash to help Trump during the campaign. Then there's Michael Cohen. Donald Trump's former fixer attorney, he got handed a three-year sentence to federal prison yesterday, as we reported. His crimes? Breaking campaign finance laws by paying hush money to Stormy Daniels and Playboy Playmate Karen McDougal, tax evasion, and lying. Trump, he just did an interview with Fox, and here's what he had to say about his former close confidant. Why did you hire Michael Cohen? He was known as a ago, fixer. Taylor, first of all. First that was his all, title, he did a very low-level work. Why did he you did need him? He did more public relations than he did law, but he did stuff. You'd see him on television, and he was okay on television. President also going on a Twitter tirade about the whole developments earlier today. Now I'm going to paraphrase here, otherwise we'll be here all night. This is three tweets long, and not all of it is worth reading. You'll trust me on that. Trump saying he never directed Cohen to break the law. He also said he didn't do anything wrong as the money he paid. It wasn't campaign money. And even if the charges were true, the liability would be civil, not criminal. He also tweeted that Cohen was trying to embarrass him and get a reduced sentence. And finally, he said that Cohen, he has been a liability to him. Now, perhaps Trump forgot that Michael Cohen taped some of their earlier conversations, including some that have been released. Here's the two of them discussing the hush money. It ends abruptly, but you'll get the picture if you listen carefully. When it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you, so... No, 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 I got... No, no, no. Also, the publisher of the National Enquirer, He's reached an agreement to cooperate with federal prosecutors that, in exchange, American media will not be prosecuted for possible campaign finance violations, so they're also playing ball. The publisher admitted that it was involved in the scheme to, quote, catch and kill stories about women having affairs with Donald Trump. Porn star Stormy Daniels, former playmate Karen McDoodle, they were each paid six figures to keep quiet. The Inquirer agreed they would not publish their stories after purchasing them during the campaign. And we're also learning that American media CEO David Pecker, he kept documents with damaging information about Trump in a safe in his office. And this wasn't just limited to what was going on in 2016. This goes well before it. Plus, CNN reporting that Trump was actually in the room when Cohen and Pecker were discussing the hush money payments. Then there's a steady stream of stories that the Inquirer published. They went after Hillary Clinton and propping up Trump, including the infamous front page story linking Ted Cruz, then a primary challenger, linking his late father to the JFK assassination. That one came out during the primaries when Cruz was neck and neck with Trump. Of course, Trump parroted that story on the campaign trail. Now, during his interview with Fox News, Trump also spoke about campaign finance violations. Here again, the president. Every lawyer, look, Trump didn't violate campaign finance laws, and neither did the president. Trump ex aid. So they're saying oh, that... Oh, wait. I interviewed him on my program the other okay. day. That's Han von Spaskowski. Yes, Here's he another one. That. Michael Cohen pled guilty to something that's so, not even a crime. Wait a minute. These are campaign... Nobody, except for me, would be looked at like this. Nobody. Trump the victim. Now, we're also getting late-breaking news about yet another investigation into Donald Trump. The Wall Street Journal, and I remind you, that is owned by Rupert Murdoch, reporting that federal prosecutors are probing whether his inaugural committee misspent some of the $107 million that it raised. They're also looking at whether or not some top donors gave money in return for access to the incoming 
president. By the way, this investigation was prompted in part by documents retrieved when the feds raided, yes, Michael Cohen's office. As they say, stay tuned. A lot to talk about. And for that, of course, we turn to former federal prosecutor Roland Riopelle. Um, a busy day, a busy week. L let me start off first, Roland, with that inauguration story that broke. This is a criminal investigation that's being launched yeah. in the Southern District. And this didn't just happen in the last 48 hours. They've been working on this for a while. Again, not civil, criminal. This could be a big deal. I mean, a lot of people have always wondered whether to do with the charities, that he never gave the money to the vets that he had promised, and, and so many questions relating to the Trump Foundation. Where did all that money go? Literally nine figures. And now apparently, at least by the state standpoint, they think um, some machinations were going on. It didn't go where it was promised. Yeah, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're investigating things like kickbacks uh, given by the vendors who who did the work on the event. You know, a lot twenty-eight million dollars or something like that appears to be the amount spent uh, on um, you know the people who put the event together. That seems like an awful lot. You wonder where all that money went. And, and yes, you know, donations to the um, inaugural in exchange for favors, that sounds like vintage Trump, doesn't it? Um, so I'm sure that there's plenty of evidence that was obtained from Michael Cohen's office, and I'm sure that the Southern District is methodically running it down uh, bit by bit, and it could well develop into any one of a number of cases. And I will just say, and this obviously not a legal observation, but... For a guy who took great pains to tell everyone how much money it was worth in the billions up to 10 billion, the idea that he repeatedly, at every opportunity, would skin money off the top that was designed either for charity or other purposes to line his own pockets, if not even just criminal, uh, bordering on the pathetic. All right, let's get into the next issue, which is now we learned not just was there an agreement with American media, but Donald Trump was present for the conversation with Pecker, the CEO, and also Michael Cohen. He literally was in the same room with these guys working out a deal to basically pay hush money to keep things quiet because they were concerned about the impact in the campaign. And by the way, both Pecker apparently and Cohen have testified that they knew it was illegal what they were doing. So you would think they would pass that on to their client. Yeah, I, I think this is kind of game, set, and match for Mr. Trump on this issue. He does have the sort of quasi-immunity that we assume presidents have, so I don't know that he's going to be indicted for this conduct today. But there are two witnesses who have pointed the finger directly at him. There's also that tape that Mr. Cohen made of the subsequent meeting with Mr. Trump where they're talking about paying at least one of these women off. And there's Alan Weisselberg, who we know is cooperating with the Southern District, who no doubt confirms a great deal of this. So I think this is a rock solid, rock solid uh, felony case uh, against Mr. Trump. And it's just a question of when it will be brought. That's all. And again, just as a frame of reference, you're talking about somebody near 70 years of age being this undisciplined and this reckless. The relationship with Pecker and the Inquirer goes back well over a decade. Apparently, as I mentioned before, Literally, it's like out of a, you know, a bad B movie here. There's a safe where they kept all this dirt. Is it your understanding or your belief that probably the feds have gotten their hands here on this safe and, they've, and they know at least what the contents are? They, they, unless Mr. Pecker destroyed it before the feds came to him, in which case I think he probably would have been uh, required to plead to some kind of obstruction of justice count in addition to, and wouldn't have gotten immunity straight out. Um, uh, you know, I think that whatever is in that safe was turned over by Mr. Pecker to the government. Uh, they could have subpoenaed him for it. They could have demanded it as a condition of his uh, cooperation agreement with them, the immunity agreement he has. So uh, I'm sure that whatever was in that safe, the government has. So your so, guess is as good as mine as to how salacious it will be but it could be pretty bad stuff. Um, every other uh, chapter in this story has been uh, not PG-13, so let's go from the salacious or the unseemly to now spycraft, literally like a Le Carre movie here. Um, Maria Butina. First, it sounded like, you know, um, this was just somebody who, like so many of these bit players, aspired to be something more than she was. But then the more we learn 
um, about how she literally infiltrated and got access to not just higher ups within the NRA, but she was given, and this is at least my world, that you get the first question at a press conference with Donald Trump, and you're going to ask a question on sanctions, and believe it or not, he's actually prepared for the answer for that. That doesn't happen by happenstance. So, in fact, let me just remind people, this is somebody who is not part of any media group with no access. Somehow, some way, she gets the first question when this person was the most arguably in-demand politician in the world. Here again, Maria Butina to then-candidate Trump. Do you want to continue the politics of sanctions? I know Putin, and I'll tell you what, we'd get along with Putin. I don't think you'd need the sanctions. Okay, so... The story gets juicier for me, Roland, when all of a sudden the NRA gets a mass infusion of money um, from people believed with Russian ties, oligarchs or whatever else. Now, given that there is no gun ownership in Russia, it's a very curious contribution, that money immediately then gets funneled, we believe, to the campaign or support um, or supporting elements as a PAC form, so you can't really trace it, to um, Trump interests, let's just say. And we're talking a lot mm -hmm. of money here. All of a sudden, yes. I got to think Mueller's following the money trail. If we can connect the dots between the Russians in the middle of a campaign, not just doing a disinformation campaign, but coordinating with the presidential campaign of Trump to, to basically throw the election with a foreign operative. I mean, I don't even know what you call this. Yeah, well, it, it does look like a conspiracy again to violate the campaign finance laws. If Mr. Trump and the Russians and Ms. Uh, Butina, a, as the sort of tip of the spear, were working together, and there is some evidence of that. Again, the press conference you cite seems to show that there was coordination and agreement between Trump and Butina as to the question that would be asked and that she would get the first question and all that kind of thing. If there was coordination like that, between her and the Trump campaign and Mr. Trump, there, there's a lot of trouble there because it, you know a foreign uh, national and a foreign entity cannot support a political candidate in this country. And that appears to be what happened. If it happened with the knowledge of Mr. Trump, he's guilty again of a campaign finance violation. And if it happened with the knowledge of someone else in his campaign, that person too is guilty. It's a real problem. Now, I know there's people at home. I've even talked to people after the shows to say, oh, you know what, Rich? Uh, you know, I heard Orrin Hatch say it, and I agree. If you, if you locked up every politician who commits some campaign violation, uh, D.C. would be empty. Um, and I think, sorry, that was Congressman McCarthy who said that. Although uh, Hatch also minimized what we've seen and said, oh, you know what? He's trying to cover up an affair here. He didn't want it public. And is it really a crime? And then, oh, by the way, so they had a meeting trying to get dirt on an opponent. Let's not make this into a capital offense. I am not exaggerating, and am I, that if he was not the president of the United States, Donald Trump would be, he would go from what he is today, which is unindicted co-conspirator, to he would be, in all likelihood, going to jail for criminal actions. Any minimization of what he did, with just what we know about, forget what we're going to learn, it's that serious. Am I at all hyping it, Roland? No, no. I, I mean, particularly not with the, the David Pecker and the Michael Cohen uh, National Enquirer situation. That is uh, so clearly a felonious relationship, and Trump is so clearly in it up to his eyeballs. Um, but for the fact he was president, he would have been indicted. Um, so that's where we stand. He is... Uh, he is clearly chargeable as a participant in a conspiracy to violate the campaign finance laws. You know, Roland, um, we won't know this um, until the probe is finished and the report is delivered. And um, I'm sure a subpoena will come and Mueller will testify before the House at some point at least. But you got to imagine where he began this probe, he clearly came across evidence that he was never intending um, to stumble over. But then that changed the scope of the probe. How does a prosecutor, say you were doing this probe, all of a sudden you come across criminal activity and evidence presents itself. 
are you duty bound to expand the scope of the probe? Or do you just put blinders on and say, never mind, if it doesn't fit in these two lanes of obstruction or corruption, I'm not going to take a look? Well, re remember, uh, you know, what Mueller's done is when there is something that is really not within his purview, he refers it out. Uh, that's what happened yep. with Michael Cohen, right? He, he said, look, this really isn't a direct uh, Russia in the campaign type of thing, uh, this National Enquirer thing. I'm going to send it out to the Southern District. And they prosecuted it. And I think he's done that probably more than once. Um, I think he's been very uh, smart about, about being circumspect about what he's actually going to follow through and prosecute himself because he does not want to be accused of expanding his jurisdiction uh, unnecessarily or improperly. He wants to do the job in the most measured way possible and that gives the other side very little to criticize. I mean, we hear them squawking about, oh, it's taking too long, but you know, 30 odd people have been indicted. Right. We've got four or five convictions already. This is moving very quickly. And every day another shoe drops. As always, Roland, uh, invaluable job. Thank you so much. I always appreciate it. Thank you very much, Richard. Good to be with you. And coming up next, what if the president realizes what many others are saying, that this thing is not going to end well? A former White House ethics attorney joins us, and he says things are getting so desperate for the president, he's just about out of options that can keep him in the White House. And by the way, the lawyer who's saying that, he worked for George W. Bush.